If you've got your copy of God's Word, uh, turn with me to the book of Philippians. If you don't have a copy, uh, there are Bibles underneath the seats in front of you. And we're going to be in Philippians 2. If you're a parent, you may have heard, uh, heard it presented to you at least once uh, in, in your lifetime that having kids uh, teaches you things about uh, following Jesus, teaches you things about the gospel, teaches you things about how God feels about us. And uh, I have come to agree with that more and more. And I would add to that, if you ever have the opportunity to coach kids, then that, that just gets amplified. Um, some of you laugh because you're thinking like, yeah, like sanctification and things like that, patience. Uh, recently, a, a, a friend of mine, another member of, of Exodus, who I'm not going to do my best not to name because I didn't ask for their permission. Um, but we, uh, we just finished up few, a few months ago coaching nine and 10-year-old boys basketball. Okay, it's an epic experience. I highly recommend it. And uh, we've, we've been coaching together for a few years. And, and one of the things we learned quickly is when you go to the 9 to 10 age group, um, most of your boys who were once the uh, oldest, biggest, most experienced in one age group immediately move to the bottom of a different food chain. And the, uh, the way that the, the rec organization works is at that age group, you have a draft. And so you, your boys, either you don't show up and you just get picked uh, or you come and you do kind of a skills test, and then there's, there's rounds uh, to the draft. And, and so basically you're selected. There's no tryouts. And so the team that we had uh, was the team that we selected, right? Our, our head coach selected that team on purpose, and we wound up with the smallest, youngest team in the age group. Now, shout out to my team is that we finished second overall in the regular season. We made it to the semifinals in the tournament, Okay. But in the last game of the season, and this had been characteristic of, of, of our boys the entire season, the last game of the season, again, youngest, smallest team versus the, old, versus the oldest, biggest team. That's kind of how it shook down in the semifinals. And so we've got predominantly third grade boys going up against fifth grade boys. It may have been a while since you were in that age range, but if, if you remember being a third grade kid, right, there's a difference between third grade boys and fifth grade boys. Like, they might actually have some muscles. Like, they could do at least five push-ups without stopping. Um, some of them might be working on like the, the facial hair thing. It's like some, you know, not like a full beard, but like there's some remnants of something coming. And so we, we were out experienced and we were outsized, right? Um, they jumped out to a quick 12-0 lead early in the game. And when, when your guys aren't shooting three pointers yet, it's not like the NCAA where 12 points is nothing because people just start bombing threes. Like 12 points is a lot of work. And as the game progressed, man, our, our boys fought back and they, they never gave up. And, uh, and I would love to tell you that we won. I'm going to go ahead and spoil it for you. We, we did not win. Like, it was not a Disney, Disney movie finish. But we got close. And as the game went on, there were so many reasons why our boys could have given up. They could have turned on each other and started blaming each other for mistakes. And they didn't. They lifted each other up. In fact, every time one of our guys would score, you know, closing that, that gap, like the whole team would celebrate so much, we had to remind them they still had to play defense. They could have started arguing with us. And instead, all, the only question they asked me or our, our other coaches, man, when can I go back in? What can I do? They could have yelled at the refs because there was some questionable calls. I'm not biased. <laughs> they just kept fighting. They were diving on loose balls. Like we had one kid like with kind of bleeding in the nose and his only question was, do I have to come out? And then in the end, we lost a close game. But we took our, our team over to kind of like recap the season and, and to, we wanted to celebrate them. We anticipated there like being a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And when we got in this side room, they were just that much more fired up. They were chanting our teams one, two, three. And I can't tell you the name of the team because you'd probably be able to guess who the head coach might be. But they were more celebratory. They were more determined. And, and the thing they kept asking is, man, can we do this again next year? We set, we set for them a standard at the beginning of the season. This is what we're going to be about. This is what we want to accomplish. And then they just bought into it, and they never stopped. This morning, we're, in, we're continuing through our series, the book of Philippians. And this morning in, in Philippians 2, Paul is, is challenging and encouraging the church at Philippi to do the same thing. Hey, there has been something true for you since the beginning of this thing. There's been something that you believed, that you bought into that was greater than, than, than any reason we could find to give up, any reason that we could find to quit fighting, any reason that we could have to, to not believe. No, you believed it. And he's encouraging them to hold on to it and to, and, and to keep working towards it. 
Philippians, we're going to be, we're going to start in verse 14, uh, verse 14 through, verses 14 through 18 are following up from 2 through 13, and if you were with us last week, Pastor Brian began to unpack this idea of working out your salvation with fear and trembling. What, what does it mean to belong to Jesus and to live that out? And what Paul starts to do in our passage this morning is unpack that, and what he begins to show us is that more often than not, most consistently in the life of Christians, us working out our salvation with fear and trembling is done so together. It's done so side by side. Jesus offers to individuals salvation, but when you are saved, when you say yes to Jesus, you are brought into a family. And so what Paul is pointing out this morning, what we need to see, is that as many reasons as there may be to, to give up or to be discouraged or to fight with one another, Paul is saying this, that Jesus has done the work to make us children of God. And so we have the responsibility of living into the reality of being the family of God. Jesus has done the work. He's made the, the thing that we need to be true, true. He has done the work to make us children of God, and so we have the responsibility to live into the reality of being the family of God. So I'm going to read verses 14 through 18 of chapter 2. We're going to pray. We're going to jump into God's word together. Paul says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have this morning to be together. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be in your word together. Lord, we thank you that um, you've sent your son Jesus, and we thank you that you've given us guidance in what it means to follow him and how to live out what it means to belong to you in this life. And Lord, I pray as we look at your word together, that you would convict us where we need to be convicted if something needs to, to weigh heavy on us so that we might draw closer to you. I pray that that's what would happen. I pray if we need encouragement, if we need to have a burden lifted so that we might know your peace and presence more deeply. I pray that happens. I pray that you'd speak through me and speak through your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh. So because Jesus has done the work to make us children of God, we have the responsibility to live into the reality of being the family of God. And Paul presents three, three ways that happens, three things that we need to do for that to, to, to be our reality. I'll give you those three things and then we'll, we'll unpack them. The first of those is that we have to remove grumbling and disputing. The second is we have to take hold of what is true. And third, we rejoice in what God has done. First, we remove grumbling and complaining. Look with me again at verse 14. Paul says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is Paul beginning to unpack what he, he presents to us in, in the previous two verses about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so you may be in here this morning and you're, you're a task person. I'm like, give me something to do. Great. Work out my salvation with fear and trembling. What's next? Do I need to give a certain amount of money to missions? Do I need to move to a foreign country? Do, what, what do I need to do? And the first thing that Paul says is you keep living your life. You just remove these two things. So for some of you, that might be a buzzkill. Right? Like, what do I get to do? And he says, keep living your life, but do it without these two things. Remove these two things from the equation. Now, to those of you who are like, maybe that's not what I was expecting. I want to do something. We'll see in a moment that's far weightier than we may realize. The other side of that, you may hear that and be like, great, check. That might be one thing of all the things that, that I've heard I need to do as a Christian that I'm doing pretty well. I'm a silver lining kind of person. I'm a glass half full kind of person. Like optimism is my spiritual gift. And what Paul is not saying is just think positive and put on a happy face and things will get better. Right? That, that's, that's the message of the world. Think positive and you'll make things positive. And that's just not true. And so that's not what Paul is calling us to. And so in order for us to understand why, if Paul has just come off of saying, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, treasure what Jesus has given you in his death and resurrection to the point that it transforms everything. Okay, what do I do next? Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Well, first, do all things. That is your entire life. 
It's April. It's tax season. Without grumbling in this, you laugh, right? You know what I'm talking about. Parenting. Driving on 485 at 8 o'clock in the morning without disputing and grumbling. Coaching. Watching somebody else coach without grumbling and disputing. Marriage. Conflict between people that you're supposed to trust. All these things without grumbling and disputing. Flip it to church life specifically. If you were with us last week, Pastor Brian laid out a few things that Paul is driving at in the book of Philippians. Steadfast unity. Theological clarity. Missional courage. Sacrificial humility. All of those things without grumbling and disputing. That should start to feel a little weightier. That should start to make you question, am I, am I really working towards that? We also need to understand why this is such a big deal. And to do that, we need to look at what Paul is actually saying when he's saying, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Um, I'm going to touch on Greek, a few Greek terms throughout this sermon. And so I want to quickly note that that does not mean you need Greek to understand what the Bible says. That the, the, the English text that you have in front of you People have spent centuries and spent hours and days and months, year after year, making sure that what we have is, is the original meaning. And so I want to encourage you that Greek is helpful sometimes in clarifying things or adding a little, a little bit of punch because the English language doesn't tend to be as strong. But God is knowable to you through his word and what you have is what you need. So I want to make sure that's clear before I, I unpack a couple of things. So there's two Greek words that Paul says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Disputing is a second word, and it's a little bit easier. It's a little bit shorter to unpack. It means arguing and, and dissension. That, so let me backtrack. It's arguing and disagreeing in a way that produces division. Arguing and disagreeing in a way that produces division. So we're not talking about healthily working through topics that we need to work through. It's not us bouncing ideas of off, off of each other, lovingly disagreeing so that we grow together. This is arguing and, and, and disagreeing that lead to division. That's what disputing is. That's what he's getting at. It doesn't produce life. It doesn't produce growth. It, it, it produces fracture. But it's coming from the first word, which is grumbling. Now, grumbling is the Greek's summary of two different Hebrew words. The first of those two words is growling. Right? If, it's, if you thought animal, that's, that's, the right, that's the right mindset. An animal that, that's protecting its food, an animal that's in a bad mood, an animal that feels threatened. It's a growling. The second word that combines to make this word is rebellion. Do all things without a growling rebellion. Now, it's an uncommon word in the New Testament, but it's a really common word in, in the Hebrew. And any time that, that it's used in the New Testament, which is not, like I said, it's not super often, it's used to remind, to draw attention back to Israel traveling from Egypt to the Promised Land. It's the same word that Moses uses in the first five books of the Bible to describe Israel's complaining against him and against God. And so if you, if you don't know that story or you know that story, either way, right, God rescues Israel from Egypt. He conquers, single-handedly conquers and overthrows the international superpower of the day because Israel is, is in captivity. He says, you're my people, I made a covenant with you, and now I'm going to take you to the promised land. And time after time, from Exodus to Deuteronomy, God delivers on his word. And time after time, Israel complains. They grumble. Again, they're not, it's not a suggestion box to make things better. It is they are consistently discontent or consistently distrusting of what God has done and what God has provided. It hits a boiling point uh, in the book of Numbers where they, they have, they've made it a long way. They're close to this home that God has promised them. And God says, send spies in to scout out the land of Canaan. And Israel's response in going into the land is the army is too big, the people are too big, we can't do it. And they don't stop at fear. They result to arrogance and discontent. We need a better leader and send us back to Egypt because things were better there. We can't possibly imagine, forgetting completely everything else God has done, that this is going to work, so we're going to rebel against God. And as a result, one of those generations misses the opportunity to enter into God's rest, this promised land that God has given them. So it's a growling rebellion. Now the way that this word is, is, is defined 
is it doesn't start that loud and it doesn't start that obvious. It starts as an internal dialogue. The, the word is actually translated growling rebellion and then from the Greek directly, it's whisper murmuring, which I, didn't, I don't think is an actual word that we use anymore, but it's a whisper murmuring. It's a, it starts low. It starts internal. And it's either coming from a place of arrogance and you may not be consi- consider yourself arrogant. You may know, like all of the people that know you may not consider you arrogant, but the arrogance that it's getting at is, is you are convinced that your way is better, and if everyone else would just agree with you, or this group of people would just agree with you, then things would, things would improve. And that produces a bitterness, and it produces a distrust, because if they would just think like you thought, and it grows until it starts making its way out of your mouth. Again, not in a way to be held accountable, or not in a way to produce growth, but simply in a way to be heard and to be agreed with, and it grows, and it becomes poisonous, and it leads to disputing, and it becomes divisive, and it begins to choke the life out of believers in God's people. Or it comes from discontent. We don't have what we think we need. If I could only get, if I just had, if you would just give me, and it starts low, and it builds, and it builds until you're convincing other people that they should distrust another person or even maybe distrust God because there's something that you think you need so much and because you don't have it or don't have it in the amount that you think you should, you start to forget all that God has done for you in Jesus. And then we stop living like the people of God and we start resembling the world that Jesus came to save us from because the world, the world is rooted in discontent and the world is rooted in in this idea of if everyone would just agree with me, then things would be better. And that's what Jesus came to save us from. And so for just a moment, we need to stop and ask, where are we tempted to grumble? Because Paul is not saying do all things without them in the sense that there's like a three-step process. You do that three-step process and then you never grumble or dispute again. Paul knows as well as anybody, he says it, Romans 7, like there's an internal war going on with us. When you become a Christian, when you say yes to Jesus, then there's two natures fighting with each other. Like Paul knows this is a daily resistance. But where are you tempted to grumble? Or where do you need to repent of grumbling? Where are you growling rebelliously? Paul, there's speculation on what Paul is addressing. It could be very broad in general. Just the Philippian church in general, there's a lot of hard things in this this time period and in this area about being a Christian. And just about life in general. It could be he's trying to address there's people grumbling against the leaders of the church. It could be that he's trying to address a specific conflict within the church. I I tend to agree with the writers that say it's more broad reaching because because if we isolate it to one incident, then we, we we can potentially be deceived that if this one incident clears up, then I'm good. And this is a daily resistance for us. And so where are you either needing to repent of grumbling or where do you struggle with this the most? Is it your marriage? Either an unspoken expectation or an over-prioritized expectation that just keeps that going. Is it within the church? Members of your community group? Friends towards your pastors? Where are you tempted to grumble? Where do you maybe need to repent of letting that, an arrogance or a discontent or a combination of the two build up so high and you, it's starting to make its way out? It could also be towards God directly. You could say, like, you've got the spiritual language and the knowledge to the extent, like, I am am growling against God because there's something that I've lost or there's something that I don't have. There's something that I think if he would do it differently. We have to ask ourselves that. Where are we tempted for this to, to take root and start growing? Because Paul says for us to live into the reality of being the family of God, we have to do all of these things. We have to live our entire life to pursue the things of God without these things, removing these things, resisting these things. Now, as we continue to look at the text, he not only shows us the next thing we need to do to live into this reality as a family of God, but the very cure to fight against grumbling and disputing, and that's we take hold of what is true. Look with me at verse 15 and 16. It says that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. He presents several things that are true that we need to take hold of. Now, the the way he frames it, that you may be. It's the second time I'm going to reference the Greek. The, the, The verb for to be 
in this, in this text is uh, written in the aorist tense. Now, depending on the translation you're using, it could be worded in a number of ways, either be, to become, something along those lines. The aorist tense is, is kind of the Greek's version of the past tense, but it has a, a particular connotation, especially when Paul is using it in reference to our identity in Christ. It's referring to a present reality that is available because of a past completed act. It's a present reality that's available to us because of a completed past act. And so what he is not saying is if you, if you get rid of grumbling and disputing, then you can start to earn your place in God's family. He's saying, no, this is already available to you. He's not saying it doesn't require work. He's not saying that it doesn't require effort and pursuit. He, there's nowhere in Scripture where it says the Holy Spirit is like pixie dust, where we just sit there and it just kind of hits us and things start happening. But Paul is also abundantly clear that we are saved by grace through faith, not by something that we earn. And so kind of what does this look like? A few years ago, a martial arts instructor in the area, um, martial arts instructor I'm currently training under, had uh, his, his school broken into. He was on, off of a main street at the time, and they had a massive storefront window with the team's logo on it. And somebody decided to throw a brick through it, shatters the glass, goes in to try to find things uh, to steal. A few days later, this, this instructor uh, goes on social media. Who, he's, and he's not a social media type guy. So normally if he's on social media, it's like, hey, that's probably worth paying attention to. And he goes on social media and he says, to the person who broke into my school. Now, if I'm in his shoes, I'm following that with, I'm a martial arts instructor. Do you have any idea what you've done? Like, I have a, like go, we're, going to, we're going taken on this guy. I've got a particular set of skills. I could hurt you so bad. <laughs> but he says, to the person who broke into my school. If you are willing to come and submit yourself to teaching and to training and, and to the accountability of a team, for six months, your lessons are paid for. That's our identity in Jesus. You are invited into the family of God because God saw you, and what we needed more than anything else was to be reconciled to the God who made us, and we can't do it on our own. But God sent Jesus into the world to live a perfect life, to die on a cross on our behalf, and then he rose from the grave, conquering our greatest problems. He came to save us, meet our greatest needs, and then put everything else into its proper perspective. That's the offer of the gospel. And it is free. And what Paul is saying is don't do these things to earn this. No, he's saying live into this reality. It's available to you. You simply submit and say yes. And then he paints this picture. So taking hold of what is true, look what's true. First, your identity, who you are. You're blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, there's a point in the Gospels where Jesus is baptized and the voice, the, the Spirit of the Lord says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And what the Bible teaches past that is if you are in Jesus, if you've said yes to Jesus, God looks at you and he says the same thing. You are my son, you are my daughter with whom I am well pleased. Blameless, without spot, without blemish. Not because of what we've done, but because what, what Jesus has done. Take hold of what is true. But he keeps going. We're without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. This is one, God offering us an opportunity to do what he created us to do in the first place, which is to reflect God's glory to a watching world. That's what, whether you realize it or not, that's what your heart longs to do is to reflect God. Glory, And so there's an aspect of this text where Paul is saying God has made that possible for you again. This is why we care about how many followers we have on whatever social media platform. This is why we care about being recognized. We, we long for glory. And what Paul is saying is you were made for it. And, and God is restoring that to you. Shining like light, like stars in a crooked and twisted generation. But there's also what else is true is we are on mission. If you are in Christ, your life, regardless of occupation, regardless of gift set, you have a, a common mission that is better, more impactful, more significant, more, more worthy of your time than any other mission, and that is to shine God's light to a world that has lost its way. There's our purpose wrapped up in this, and there's also missional advancement wrapped up in this, that we'd shine like lights in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. The word for crooked in particular is an interesting word. It's the word we get our, our term scoliosis from. It's It's, it's bent doesn't hold right, doesn't function like it's supposed to. And so this is not intended to create a, a picture this morning that if you're a Christian, you are 
morally superior than people in the room that may not have given their lives to Jesus. And if you're new to Christianity or curious about Christianity this morning, that's not what's being said. But what Paul is doing, is he's painting a, distinct, a picture of a distinct difference between the light of Jesus and the confusion and the, the, the crookedness of the world. It's a world that has lost its way. It's a world that tries, that tries to, to gain what it needs most through discontent and dissatisfaction. Through pouring itself out to never receive enough. It's a world that chose fear and arrogance instead of peace with God. It's crooked. It's twisted. It's confused. Apart from Jesus, we don't think or function or relate to one another the way that we're supposed to. But God says if we take hold, if we live into this reality of what Jesus has made available for us, we reflect God's glory, we shine light, we, we proclaim a truth that there is hope, an eternal hope that's available to anybody that would trust, shining light into a crooked and twisted generation, presenting as what the Bible calls following Jesus a straight and narrow path, a straight and narrow path presented to a world that's gone crooked. And that's not all that's true. He keeps going. Holding fast to the word of life. Now, word of life in this, there are times in Scripture where Jesus is called the word of life. And then there are other times where the word of life is referring to the gospel message. In this case, it's referring to the gospel message. God sent Jesus to save sinners. Okay. Holding fast to the word of life. Now, you could read this, and depending on your translation, it could say holding fast to. It could say holding out. But most writers on the text say it's probably... A, Paul's mind it's probably a combination of both. And here's why. Because if we are holding fast to this idea of desperately clinging to something that we know is our life source, that is our safety, that is our security, the thing that cures our greatest sickness, the thing that provides our greatest hope, if we're desperately clinging to that because we believe how necessary it is, we're going to hold it out naturally to others. And so we're holding fast to the truth, right? The gospel is the foundation of everything that we believe. Right? I, I, I encourage like deepening theological truths, right? Learning and growing that's necessary, but it, it does you we never move away from, we never obtain some kind of theological knowledge or maturity where we no longer need to go back to the gospel because all of that stuff is built on the fact that God sent Jesus to reconcile a broken world to himself. So we hold fast to it as believers and then we hold it out. To the world that needs it. That's the light. That's how we do this. That's how we take hold of what is true. We place our hope in the gospel and we never let go. And why? Because what else is true? Paul says that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. There's two things that we need to see there. One is the reality of the day of Christ. The Bible does not teach, the dependent, right, there are different worldviews that would teach that history and life is circular, right, that never really ends or it just kind of spins until it stops. But the Bible teaches that it is ultimately linear, not that things don't repeat, but that ultimately we are moving from a starting point to an end point. And that's what Paul is saying to, to a Philippian church. He's like, you may be going through hard things. In fact, he knows they're going through hard things. They were, in, they were a, a, a church in the Roman Empire, in a, in a key city in the Roman Empire, and that, that community would have been vastly opposed to any message that promoted a different king and a different kingdom other than Rome. So then being Christians there is not easy, and then you combine that with just the reality that comes from sinners trying to, to honor Jesus together. There's plenty to be discouraged by. There's circumstantial things. There's relational things. But Paul is saying, Keep the end in sight. We get to live this present world with a future hope in mind. There is an end coming. And so for those of us in the room this morning, they're like, man, I am giving it my all, but man, I am weary. There's an end coming. Now, we don't know when, but it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Jesus has kept every promise that he's ever made. The final piece of that promise is when he returns and sets everything as it should be. And Paul is saying, that day is coming. And he's saying to the Philippians, what I want for you is when you stand before him, and because we will, believe it or not, when this life ends, when Christ returns, we all stand before him. And what Paul is saying, Philippians, I want you to stand before him exhausted 
and worn out, not because you chased the wrong things, but because you gave everything you had to living into this reality of being the family of God. That's what I want for you. And when he says, so that I may boast or I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, what he's not saying, what Paul's not doing is making himself more important. If you look back in chapter one, Paul uses a phrase, to live is Christ, to die is gain, to live is Christ. Paul views his life, views his purpose, views his existence as so closely tied to the mission of Jesus that he, that he longs for God's glory and he knows it would be more glorifying to God for the Philippians to finish strong than it would be for them to start to dissipate and burn out and fall apart. And so that's what he's saying. I want to, I want to say to Jesus, when I meet Jesus, they, they stuck it out, they stayed the course. Because that's more glorifying to him than if you don't. And so to live into the reality of being the family of God, we remove grumbling and disputing. We take hold of what is true. And in in doing those two things, it, it leads us to the second command. So Paul gives two commands in this text. One is to do all things without grumbling. And the second is to rejoice. In verse 17, that's where Paul takes us. Rejoice in what God has done. He says, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the, the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Rejoicing in what God has done. Paul is saying what he's saying because he loves the Philippian church. I mentioned coaching earlier. Um, at the end of that final game, and this is really true for almost every game, at the end of these games, uh, the, the head coach was almost always out of a voice. He's always hoarse. Not because he was like angrily abusing the kids with his words. I want to make that clear. But because he was enthusiastically encouraging them, yelling for them to keep going and keep pushing and giving everything he had vocally to every game. I didn't yell as much because Cramerton Rec had a rule, apparently, that only one coach could stand up and yell at a time. So early in the season, I was asked to stop doing that. Um, but my resting heart rate averages are about 55. And at the end of every one of those games, five minutes, 10 minutes after those games, I'm, I'm, I'm up in the 120s. Because we love these boys. Because we were committed to them growing and accomplishing what we, we had set for them to accomplish. So we're pouring everything we've got, emotion, vocal cords, blood pressure, all that. Paul loves the Philippian church. Read Acts 16 and how this church began. He sees a wealthy woman who had no logical reason to need Jesus, give her life to Jesus, and then say, I'm so into this, I'm going to give you my resources to plant this church. He sees a slave girl who is being used for a a unique gift. This this would be the equivalent of our modern-day girls that are being trafficked. And she's saved, and she's set free instantly. We see a, a Roman soldier, a Philippian jailer, prepared to commit suicide because he's failed at his occupation and then gives his life to something that would put his life at risk. And he says, not just for me, my family needs this. Paul loves this church. He's seen God work in this church. And so if we're going to take hold of what is true, if we're going to live into this reality, church, we've got, to, we've got to rejoice in what God has done. Because rejoicing in what he has done, past tense, informs our ability to pay attention present tense and what he's still doing. And for us as a church, are we, we, would, we doing that? We rejoicing in what God has done. And Exodus, I, I've been a, one of your pastors a little over five years. I've loved watching God work here. I mean, in fact, I'm one of your pastors because some of you led one of my best friends to Christ and he invited me here. I love what God has done. Rejoice in what God has done. He has not stopped working. And at times it's hard to see It's hard to miss. Suffering kicks in. Conflict kicks in. And Paul would say to us, likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. And this gets us to how Paul does this. Why Paul can confidently and and with conviction call us to this. He says, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all, and I can call you to rejoice. This idea of being poured out as a drink offering in the Old Testament 
you can read primarily in, in Numbers and Leviticus, kind of unpacks this, but any time a sacrifice was made to atone for sins of, of various kinds, a drink offering was a part of that process. But a drink offering followed the, the true sacrifice. And so if, if, if a bull or a goat had to be sacrificed to atone for sin, then the drink offering was either poured out on top of that offering or on the ground in front of it. And so the drink offering is a part of the, sacri- the sacrifice, but it has no meaning apart from the greater sacrifice. It, has, it finds its meaning and its power and its worth in the true sacrifice. Paul can say, pour me out, use my energy, use my life if necessary, and I'll still rejoice, and I call you to rejoice with me because Paul has never gotten over what Jesus has done for him. Matthew 26 as Jesus is, is the night before Jesus' crucifixion, he says, this is my blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Paul knows that the ultimate sacrifice has been made. Paul knows the true sacrifice, the necessary sacrifice, has been accomplished. And for us, we can pour ourselves out because Jesus, by his own words and his own actions, was poured out as the greater true sacrifice for us. And so as we seek to live this out, what does it look like to apply this? I say three things. The first, if you, if you are not sure or you can say confidently, no, I do not think that, that I have said yes to the work that Jesus did to make me a child of God. Again, either yes, I know that's not true, or I'm not sure. And Jesus came to, to call you into something beautiful, something meaningful, ultimately something that, that results in eternal life that you cannot find on your own, but he offers it freely. And so if you're not sure where to start, or you say, man, I, I've got questions, myself and other pastors will be out in the comments area, we'd love to have that conversation with you. But why not say yes to a Savior who poured himself out instead of holding on to a world that says grumble and dispute, pour yourself out and never receive anything in return. And the last two things, if you're a part of the family of God, number one, let grace transform your grumbling. Let grace transform your grumbling. If, if you have an issue, if you have a concern, if you have discontent, if you have hurt, God does not say bury those things and don't address them. He says bring them to the light. There's a conversation you need to have with one of us, one of your pastors. If there's a conversation you need to have with someone who you might have resentment towards, if there is some, some wound you carry that's causing you discontent towards God himself, man, bring that to the light. Bring that to people who can help you process it, who can walk with you through it. Because there's something transformative on the other side of that if you will bring it to Jesus. And then finally, work to rejoice. God is at work, and he's been at work. And for us to hold on to and live into the reality of what it means to belong to him together, we cannot lose sight of what he's done. And part of the way that we do that is continuing to recount together all that we've seen him do. So work to rejoice. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you again for this time. Lord, we thank you for this truth. We thank you that you came to save us, to call us into a family, and Lord, we need you to help us to do that. And so, Father, I pray that, man, we would see what you offer us as beautiful and amazing. We would experience, like, a deep felt need for you. And then, Father, we would experience the joy and the life that comes from living into the reality of what it means to be yours. And we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.